Good afternoon. Uh, welcome. I'm John. I'm the event director at Literati Bookstore. We're pleased to welcome Lindsay McDivitt for a special story time reading of Truth and Honor, the President Ford's story. Um, some Zoom etiquette, you heard me as you came in. Uh, you probably also hear a weed whacker uh, coming through my window, so if you do, I apologize. Um, but you hear me as you came in. We do ask that you keep your video off through the remainder of the uh, event, and you're muted, and you'll remain muted. Um, speaker views are going to be the ideal experience today as well, since we'll be doing uh, story time, and uh, we'll have a screen share so you can see the whole book. Um, and the chat is closed as well, but you might want to keep the chat window open. Um, because I'll be in there to uh, provide links to purchase Truth and Honor. And you can also ask any questions you might have for a Q&A following the reading um, in that chat box at any time. So while the chat is closed to the public, you can still keep the chat box open because I'll be sending links to purchase Truth and Honor. And you can also submit questions for the Q&A whenever the uh, spirit moves you to do so. Um, as a reminder, you can purchase Truth and Honor on our website, actually on the page that brought you here today. And if you're watching later on YouTube, there are, of course, always links in the description below to purchase. You can also shop for more books at literatiebookstore.com. Thousands of titles are available for curbside pickup if you live in Southeast Michigan. In lieu of a book purchase, we'd also ask that you consider a $5 donation to sustain our virtual programming. So whether you'd like to think of that as this week's subscription or this month's subscription or a $5 subscription for the entire year, you can make a donation at literatibookstore.com slash donation. Otherwise, we simply thank you for your attendance this afternoon. So without further ado, Lindsay McDivitt writes fiction and nonfiction for children. Her picture books, Nature's Friend, the Gwen Frostick story, and Truth and Honor, the President Ford story, were published by Sleeping Bear Press. A third picture book biography comes out in 2021. Lindsay is passionate about, write, about tackling ageism in books for children. She began writing children's books after many years in health education, where she co-edited a book of true stories of hope and healing by stroke survivors. Please join me uh, in using your Zoom clap or heart reactions to welcome Lindsay McDivitt to your living rooms. Hello, everyone. I'm so pleased to be here today. Thank you so much to Literati Bookstore and to John for handling all the logistics today. And thank you for your support of independent small bookstores, really important in this challenging time. I'm really thrilled to be here and I just want to mention a few things before I read the book. Um, one, if you're interested in having a signed copy of the book, I'm happy to send out signed book plates. Um, to you personally, you can just contact me through my website at lindsaymcdivitt.com. Um, also at my website are some tremendous free resources um, through the Ford Presidential Museum. The links are on my website, um, such as some other videos of me and the illustrator Matt Faulkner talking about our writing and illustration processes. And um, I'd also like to mention there's a number of quotes throughout the text, um, quotes of, of President Gerald Ford and um, others. And I don't necessarily read all the quotes, but they're there for you to read on the page. They don't necessarily flow um, when reading out loud. Um, and especially for Michiganders or Michiganians, uh, take note of all the references to Michigan throughout. I like to use a lot of metaphors and similes and in this book, they were very much Michigan oriented as President Ford was the only president raised in Michigan. So without further ado, I'm gonna share screen and show you the, the text. You should see me just in the top right corner to choose the, there we go. So hopefully you see the entire uh, book. Truth and Honor, the President Ford story. President Gerald Ford sat down at his new desk in the Oval Office and rolled up his sleeves ready for work. He'd never planned to be president, but Ford was just the leader America needed. He would help mend what was broken, the trust between the people and their government. Americans would see their new president could be counted on to tell the truth. Honest and hard working, he followed the rules. He cared deeply about all Americans Gerald Ford could steer them through the turbulence of recent events. His life had prepared him well. Plus, liberty was at his side. 
As a baby in 1913, Junior, as he was called back then, survived stormy times. His mother, Dorothy, escaped her violent husband by clutching her baby close and slipping out the door without even a suitcase. Dorothy fled Omaha, Nebraska to her parents with Junior, then just 16 days old. They all moved to Grand Rapids, Michigan to start a new life. Dorothy remarried when Junior was too small to recall the father they'd left behind. Now he had a stepfather, Gerald Ford, an honorable man, as dependable as the lighthouse shining at Grand Haven Beach. As Junior grew, his stepfather threw footballs to him and took him fishing. Gerald Sr. became the father Junior loved. The new family grew close and Junior tried to follow his parents' three rules. Tell the truth, work hard, and come to dinner on time. Junior found lessons to be learned from those close to him. From his stepfather, Junior learned to be hardworking and honest, to play by the rules. From his mother, he learned to think of others and to study hard, and to control his hot temper most of the time. From the people of Grand Rapids, good neighbors and friends, Junior Ford learned to respect many kinds of people, including those new to America. The Great Depression hit and hardships buffeted the Fords. Business was bad at his family's paint store and they lost their home to the bank. But the Fords found joy all around them, joy as deep and vast as the Great Lakes ringing their state. Junior raced down Ottawa Beach with his little brothers. He and his stepfather trolled for trout on the Paramarquette River. Mother's cooking and happy spirit brought them together for dinner. Before long, Junior was given the same name as the stepfather he admired. Junior became known as Gerald with a G, but Jerry with a J. But still, life sometimes felt like being caught in a whirlwind. Young Jerry hoped the teacher wouldn't call on him. Although he was smart, he struggled to speak, and left-handed Jerry was expected to write with his right hand. He tried and tried until finally teachers stopped forcing him. Once he was allowed to be different and write with his left hand, Jerry's stuttering stopped. Working multiple jobs to help out his family, Jerry learned to get things done. He mixed colors and cleaned out vats at his stepfather's paint store. He hefted crates of sodas and Cracker Jacks at an amusement park. He washed dirty dishes and waited on lunch customers at Bill's place. Jerry attended a public high school where students strive to succeed through hard work, no matter where they came from or the color of their skin. The desire for the American dream flowed through the school as strongly as the Grand River flowed through town. Jerry's stepdad believed sports taught you how to live, how to compete, but always by the rules. And Jerry dove into sports with gusto, slicing through the water as a swimmer, racing down the track or basketball court, and tackling players on the football field. With his Boy Scout troop, Jerry spent time in the wilderness and helping his community. As an Eagle Scout, he was one of the first chosen to serve as honor guard at the fort on Mackinac Island. His efforts made his mother proud. From the Boy Scouts, he learned patriotism and to be of service to others. From sports, he learned teamwork and how to follow the rules of the game. And from fellow students, Jerry learned what it meant to struggle and strive. Jerry made plans for college. His future looked as bright as the Dutch tulips that decorated his city. But dark clouds loomed during the Great Depression. Millions searched for work. Jerry's stepdad took less money home so he could keep all his workers on the job. His mother volunteered collecting food for people in need. The Fords felt fortunate, but there was no money for college. So Jerry worked harder. Two jobs washing dishes on campus, plus a $100 gift from his high school, covered tuition and expenses at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. He made the football team, playing home games in the enormous new stadium. On road trips, Jerry and his new buddy, Willis Ward, were roommates. Back then, many hotels would not permit African-Americans to stay as guests. So before away games, 
the coach called ahead, demanding Willis be allowed in with the team. Teams from the South often refused to share the field with black players. In 1934, Willis was forced to sit out a home game against Georgia Tech. Jerry had a temper, usually under control, but now he was angry, furious. He wrestled with what to do. Should he refuse to play or quit the team altogether? Making this decision was more difficult than scaling the steep dunes on the shores of Lake Michigan. He sought out advice. He listened hard. He wrote to his stepfather. He spoke more with his coach. Finally, he talked to Willis. The team needs you, said Willis. You need to play. Go pound them for me, he told Jerry. Reluctantly, Jerry played and Michigan won, but he never forgot that ugly lesson. After college, Jerry turned down offers to play professional football. His goal was law school. Again, there was no money. But he got two jobs, coaching jobs at Yale University in Connecticut. At first, Yale wouldn't let him into their prestigious law school, but he kept pushing until he had his degree. Graduating with good grades, he declined jobs with big firms and packed his bags for Michigan. First, he'd open his law office, and then he was planning to run for office. But while driving home from his office on December 7, 1941, Jerry's radio blared the news. Japanese planes had attacked Pearl Harbor. Jerry knew his duty. When America declared war on Japan, he volunteered for the Navy. On the aircraft carrier Monterey, Jerry was barraged by storms and battles at sea. One night, an enormous typhoon hit. Sirens sounded and Jerry rushed to the deck as huge waves rocked the ship. He was thrown down, sliding toward the roiling sea. Almost too late, Jerry caught the tiny deck edge with his feet and saved himself. Grateful to return to the peaceful fields and forests of Michigan, Jerry wanted to help people, beginning with those in his home state. Michigan badly needed an honest worker in government, much as its orchards needed rain and sunshine. So Jerry campaigned in Grand Rapids for the United States Congress. From college and law school, he learned to listen to both sides and to seek out the best advice. From coaching, he learned leadership and how to encourage teamwork. From fighting to free other nations, he learned how important American democracy was to peace and justice worldwide. In 1949, Michigan voters sent Jerry to the House of Representatives. People in his dis district trusted that he heard their concerns and would speak up for them. With his new bride, Betty, he moved to Washington, D.C. Harry Truman was the first of six presidents Jerry Ford worked with as a Republican congressman. Jerry believed the political parties were on the same team he became known for working with the Democrats, bridging the gap the way the Mackinac Bridge connects Michigan's peninsulas. During his 25 years in Congress, Gerald Ford's votes supported the rights of Americans, all religions, genders, abilities, and colors. He never forgot the racism that hurt his friend Willis in college. And Jerry never stopped listening to the people of Michigan. In the 1970s, the country faced a flood of bad news. Both the president and vice president were accused of breaking the law and lying about it. The people marched demanding the truth. Vice President Agnew was forced to leave his job. President Nixon needed a new vice president, one who followed the rules, one who people trusted. He selected Jerry Ford. Jerry knew there was a chance President Nixon might be convicted of his crimes, then he, Gerald Ford, would become president. The events of 1974 rocked the nation. President Nixon was forced to step down and Gerald Ford became the 38th president of the United States. We are ready, Jerry told Betty, who was by now a trusted helpmate. 
Jerry's new desk was piled high with problems. New storms threatened. The war in Vietnam was ending and Jerry wanted to help the thousands of refugees who were now in need of a country to call home. There were fears of another depression. People worried about paying for food, gasoline, and housing. But now, Americans had a president they could trust working for them, a president with integrity, and Jerry knew how to navigate tough times and make the right choices. He knew how to learn from those around him, to look out for others. He knew how to lead. President Ford would do his very best to steer the country to safety. They were all in this together, and Gerald R. Ford was a strong captain at the helm. That's the end of the, the narrative. Uh, at the very back of the book, what we call back matter, there's a delightful letter from the four children of Gerald Ford and Betty Ford, Mike, Jack, Steve, and Susan Ford. There's also a timeline of President Ford's uh, life and the ma major events. I'm gonna stop screen sharing now, and if you have questions, you can address them through the, the chat and John will relay them to me. Thank you so much for your attention today. Thank you so much. Yes, and folks, if, have, if you have questions, please feel free to ask them in the chat. Um, but I'll start off. Um, and so yeah, if you have a question, you can, you can uh, open up the chat box and just write it and I'll be the one who sees it and I'll uh, uh, relay it to Lindsay. But uh, I thought maybe I'd ask first by, um, you know, it takes a lot of research to write a book like this, historical research. And so I'm wondering, how do you um, sort of compress that research into the size of a picture book and choose what you want to include and what you want to not include? And I'm also curious um, what kind of assistance or help or um, cooperation you had with the Ford Library and President's Estate. Oh, good questions. Thanks, John. Um, so this book was actually um, born when uh, staff from the Ford Presidential Museum in Grand Rapids, Michigan approached Sleeping Bear Press, um, saying that they would really like to see a picture book biography um, of Gerald Ford, and then I was asked to write it. And I didn't actually know very much about President Ford. I was um, in high school in the 70s when he became president, and I I distinctly remember the relief of um, being past Watergate and him being a trustworthy president. And um, it was really kind of a pleasure to dig in and learn more. So I started my research, um, look, I started it with looking at what kind of president he was and um, reading quite extensively on that. And then delving into his childhood and seeing really how he became uh, who he was, the leader we needed. So. Um, I bookended the, the story, as you noticed, with him as starting out as president in the beginning of the book and then ended the book with him also as president. And the majority of the text is really about his, um, his growing up years and how he was formed into the person uh, that we needed at that time. I hope I answered your questions. Yeah, absolutely. Um, there's some questions here from the viewers. One is, um, how long did it take you to write the book uh, once the research was completed? Um, it's really difficult to distill all the research that you do into, I don't know, it's probably like 1600 words at the most, 1500 words. And uh, so there were many, many drafts. Um, this was an unusual process for me because I had my editor, Sarah Rocket, involved from the beginning um, at Sleeping Bear Press. And so she saw some really awful drafts early on. Um, but I also look all the time I'm researching for the things that children might be attracted to, the little bits of uh, color, I call it. And so, you know, things like the fact that he almost slid off into the sea off the aircraft carrier, you know, those are the kind of things where I think I have to include that or his stuttering as a child. Um, I think those kind of things are important to children. Absolutely. Oh, the timing as far as how long mm -hmm. it took me, probably almost a year. There's a question, I think we see it briefly, but, uh, or it's mentioned early on, did President Ford have any brothers or sisters? He had three younger stepbrothers, or half-brothers, should say, after his mother married Gerald Ford Sr. 
Um, and then there's a question. Uh, could you ever see writing a biography of Betty Ford for children? It would be an honor to do that. Yeah, she's, she, I learned more about her too. I'd always found her really a fascinating, uh, very assertive, interesting woman and especially for her era. So it'd be great to see a picture book biography of Betty. And then another question here. Um, did you communicate with the illustrator at all? Did you have input on what was illustrated? A lot of people don't realize that, um, for one, most authors have no choice in the illustrator. Uh, I was secretly hoping for Matt Faulkner. He's a Michigander and a tremendous award-winning illustrator. Um, but no, typically the book is considered half the illustrator and they can interpret your words and it's their book as much as, as your book. The only thing that you do as the author look at early sketches and um, you're asked just to check for any um, inaccuracies. But as far as the way it evolved on the page, that's all the illustrator. A lot of comments here about the, uh, the, the beauty of those illustrations and they really are Beautiful. wonderful. Yeah. I hope everybody noticed in the one spread, I think it's where Ford and his half brothers are running on the beach. The, the clouds in the back actually form the, the Michigan peninsula. Oh, wow. That's, I didn't <laughs> notice that. I'm gonna have to go back and look at that. Um, there is a, um, uh, you've, I mentioned in your, in your biography that you've, you're working on a book coming out in 2021. And there's a question here about what is the subject of your next book? Um, it's another picture book biography with Erdman's book, Books for Young Readers, which is based in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And it's actually a picture book biography of Nelson Mandela. And that was the first manuscript I sold um, four years ago, and, and it's finally coming out in March. Is, and is that in association with, with any, uh, in the same way that uh, there's some, you know, you're, you're have some collaboration with the Ford Library. Is there, um, do you have plans for um, that, that book having connection with a lot of the um, sort of, Oh, what do I want to say? I think there's a museum um, as well for Mandela. So there's, and... You're right. There's a museum on Robben Island, which is where um, Nelson Mandela spent 18 of his 27 years in prison. And that's what really sparked this manuscript for me. I visited Robben Island about six or seven years ago. And I was just so struck by um, how he came out of prison ready to lead a country of people of all races and um, so I delved into that, not really meaning to write about him, um, hmm. just out of my own astonishment and curiosity. And, and the book was just kind of born. <laughs> um, did you travel um, to do research for any of your other books, for maybe for this one or for your earlier book? Yeah, so I lived in Ann Arbor for um, seven years, but I was living in Minnesota when I started writing this book. So I was fortunate to make a research trip to Michigan, um, to Grand Rapids in particular, where I had not spent a lot of time. And uh, to tour the museum, I was able to get a personal tour of the museum and then visit um, a number of places, including um, the restaurant where Gerald Ford met his birth father for the first time as a teenager. Uh, Leslie King uh, Sr. was his stepfather, who was really not a part of his life. Um, and saw where he went to school and the beach where he ran with and played with his half brothers. And that really helped to add the color that I like to add to the picture book to make it interesting to kids. And I learned a lot. Did you communicate as well with, with the living members of Ford's family during any of your biographical research? That's a great question. I would hate to forget that I was fortunate enough to talk to one of Gerald Ford's sons, Mike Ford, on the phone. Um, and that really was just such a great uh, insights and confirmation of what I'd learned about uh, Ford's character. Really, really helpful. Well, um, we're reaching the top of the hour uh, or the top of the half hour, excuse me. Um, and so um, uh, I just want to, on behalf of the story, thank you again for, for this really lovely story time and for answering um, everybody's questions today. Um, as a reminder, you can uh, purchase Truth and Honor at literatibookstore.com. And as Lindsay mentioned, if you wanted to sign book plate, you can get in touch with her um, at her website. website. 
Yep. And wow, um, so thank you. And, um, con and congrats on the success of this book and um, very excited um, for the book coming out in 2021. And hopefully we can have you um, in the store uh, for a story time okay. up in the children's section soon. Um, so thanks again right. for joining us and for everyone who, who joined us um, from wherever you're joining us from, continue to stay safe and uh, we'll see you at the next event. Take care, everybody. Thanks again. Thanks for joining us, everyone. Appreciate it. Bye now. Bye-bye.